Amen. Nehemiah chapter 8. As we have a theme for the year of growth, and this month in particular we're talking about church growth, which obviously isn't just the amount of people. It's the spiritual growth inside of the church within each and every individual. I want to put our attention this morning on verse number 8. If you'll look at it with me, Nehemiah 8.8. 8. The Bible reads, So they read in the book of the law distinctly and gave the sense and caused them to understand the reading. This is an interesting passage because what we're looking at here, these are this is actually an Old Testament church service. They're gathering together. If you know the history of it, Ezra and Nehemiah, Ezra was a priest. As the temple was being restored, he came to begin to restore the church services and the teaching of the law. Nehemiah was a cupbearer for the king, and he came to restore the wall and also the gates and to begin to put the protection back in the city for those that were there. It was a neat event that happened in history that God had ordained. And we see in Nehemiah chapter 8, these events that we just read is this culmination of a church service of people gathering together, praying, singing, worshiping. And at the pinnacle of the church service, at the center of it all, is the opening of the Word of God, the reading of the Word of God, and preaching out of the Word of God. Now, we as a Baptist church, that's what we do. That's what we do. And, and the title of my sermon this morning is Why We Need Bible Preaching. Yeah. Why We Need Bible Preaching. Not every church does it the way that we do it. And I feel sorry for those churches uh, where some guy dressed like a teenager gets up on a, on a bar stool and just jams with everybody for 15 minutes and motor, you know, hey, and speaks pleasant words. And listen, we ought to encourage each other. But the Bible preaching, the Bible teaching is a pattern that God has given to us. And this is the best thing in this world. And when we get it inside of us and so we understand what to do with, with it, it really can change lives. I want you to understand that Bible preaching can change lives. We, as a New Testament Christian church, were different than the others. A Catholic church, for instance. The center of what they do is the Mass, which is where they literally crucify Jesus again. It's kind of weird, right? Or a Protestant church, by the way, which they put, uh, they'll, they'll focus on doing the communion, the Lord's Supper, every week, and that's the center of attention. Around here we have a pulpit of wood and we open the Word of God and we read out of it and then we're going to give the sense so that you can have the understanding of what it means and how it applies to you. This is a Bible pattern uh, and I want to point out first of all if you notice the source of the truth if you look at it he, it says they read in the book of the law of God. You know uh, there I, I literally just saw last night a church giving a sermon series on The Incredibles, which is apparently, I, I think, a Disney movie or a Pixar movie of some cartoon family. I've seen in the past where they do a sermon series on Superman or on X-Men. You guys know what I'm talking about. You ever seen some of these strange, odd sermon series? Around here, we want to do it on this. Now look, it's relevant and timely, and what happens in the news should be filtered through the Word of God, but I'm not going to go and preach about what some movie theater, some blasphemous story they're telling, and then try to draw it into the church and then add some Jesus to it. That's not right. This is the center and the source and the authority for all truth. It's God's holy Word. This is what we need more than anything else the source of truth, the authority of truth. Notice also their method. Again, focus on verse 8 with me. Notice their method. It says they gave the sense. They gave the sense. To give the sense means that you're uh, helping somebody understand it. It's explaining what that means. It's so you can comprehend what it means. The book of Hebrews uses a phrase talking about the Word of God. It compares those that don't know how to use the Word of God. They need the milk of the Word, like get your daily Proverbs and boy, read some John and Romans. But then it says that those that are ready for strong meat, the deeper things of the Word of God, Revelation and 
Ezekiel and Hebrews, I mean, the, the heavy lifting, right? It says that they have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. The more you use this, the better you're going to get with it. If I pulled a sword out and I asked Justice to show us some moves, he could only do so much. I have not proved this sword, right? Now, if I sent him home with it for a month and I said, come back and show us what you got, boy, he'd put us all to shame, wouldn't he? Now, it's the same thing with the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. We need our senses exercised by reason of use. The preaching that he's talking about in Nehemiah 8, he's reading the Word of God, and then he tells them what it means so they know what to do with it. The final statement there, if you notice, uh, notice the result. It ca he caused them to understand. Bible preaching should help you understand what to do with your life, what to do with your situation, what to do with your time and money. And I mean, everything in life, we should filter it through the Word of God. And we get that through Bible preaching. Uh, I'm an advocate for in your spare time, if you have to travel, if you have to drive to work somewhere, you ought to get an audio Bible. You ought to listen to some preaching. If you need a recommendation, like, uh, I've heard enough of you, Pastor Fanny. Give me another preacher to listen to. I'll give you somebody else to listen to. You know what's funny? Uh, in this passage, they're coming to a time of restoring God's blessing, and they open up the book. Did it, said, did it say one of the many copies? I mentioned this on Wednesday as we talked about the preserved word. We have a book bias. We have an issue with books. Um, I mean, there are literally 100 Bibles in this building right now. Over 100 Bibles. They're free. You want one? Take one. I got nice ones. I got little ones. I got New Testaments. Take one, right? Back then, they had one. And not everybody could read. Today, we live in a time where, I mean, the majority of the uh, adults around here and even a lot of the teenagers have a cell phone. You can go to a Bible app pick a verse, hit play, and hear a dramatized version of somebody reading it and telling you what it, like, wow, that's great. Man, I got all this power in my pocket. And we've got it right here. You have your own personal copy. Back then, they did not have that. They were very appreciative of being able to hear the Word of God. Yeah. It had a massively profound effect on their life. Sure. This is the power of Bible preaching. Uh, I mean, it's it's Bible preaching in my life personally that has helped me to make many decisions in life. Many changes in life. Many convictions in life came under the hearing of Bible preaching after uh, receiving the Holy Spirit convicting me from hearing Bible preaching. Uh, obedience came from Bible preaching. Self-determination. You know what, Lord? You're right. I see it your way. You said it and I forgot and I'm sorry and I've sinned against you and I want to do it your way. This is the authority. This is the truth. This is the power. And I want to honor you, Lord. And I, it happened after Bible preaching. It could very easily be said that even in my personal life, there were times in my life where I was failing as a Christian because I was not under sound Bible preaching. And I know this is a hard message to receive from a preacher. Listen, not everything that I say is true. But I'll tell you this, everything in here is true. Sometimes I get excited about politics or what's in the food and the water and all that kind of stuff. And if, and if I offend you, I'm sorry, okay? You know? Or maybe you should live your life like that. I don't want to be that guy. I don't want to give unsolicited advice. But I'm here to tell you, God's plan is we gather together, we open this up, we read what it says, and then through the power of the Holy Spirit, we understand it so we can make a change in our life and become a better Christian. That's God's plan. We need Bible preaching. Hearing it reminds us of God's will. They read in the book. They read in the book distinctly. What does distinctly, distinctly set apart? Set apart. To distinguish something. I'll make it real simple. Which one of these lines is distinguished? It's different, it's special. It's a no-brainer. I'm being facetious, but I want you to understand. We should honor this and reverence this more than our own opinion or what some newscaster says or what some other book says or what some concordance says or what some scholar says. This is distinct and it ought to be something that you remember. 
It ought to be read in such a manner that there's power in this and we perceive it and we honor it and we respect it and we reverence the Word of God. It's uh, clear and loud, set apart, honored. We want to give the sense. We want to know what it means. We want to not just have the understanding, but we also want to, we want to understand what it means for us personally. My prayer is that you'll leave out of here seeing that Bible preaching is something that will change your life if you'll let it, and you ought to search after it more and more. It ought to be, I mean, hey, every time the door's open, you ought to come listen to some preaching. Every chance you get to open it for yourself every morning, you ought to be doing some Bible reading. You ought to be filling your free time, getting closer to God through His Word. This is important. Look at the last verse, and the, the last sentence in the next verse, verse number uh, 9, uh, it says, For all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. So there was reading and preaching, then there's this response. Sometimes when you get close to God, and you see how God sees us, and you see how God sees sin, you begin to see yourself a little more humbly. He says at the end of verse 9, all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. Uh, I believe that the power of the Word of God through preaching has this effect on your heart that demands a response. Uh, teaching is just telling you the facts. Preaching is like teaching on fire. It's like saying, hey, now you're, you're responsible to God. You have to answer for what He's showing you. What will you do this is the power of Bible preaching and, and you know sometimes when you listen to Bible preaching it kind of makes you cry and mourn and question things and it reminds you it's time to change and hey I have a duty to God and I need to do what he's called me to do and just not stop doing it you know, the command has not changed right look at the next verse verse 10 then he said unto them go your way and eat the fat and drink the sweet Send portions unto them to whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy unto our Lord. Neither be ye sorry, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Listen, when you hear Bible preaching, uh, there's a response. And then sometimes you choose to repent. You know what, Lord? I do want to move in the right direction for you. You know what, Lord? I hear it. I want to change my mind. Will you use me? Can you help me? Uh, and, but then he says, this is interesting. Now, you can tell they're Baptists here. These are some Old Testament Baptists that says they're eating and drinking and sending food to each other, right? Uh, but notice when he says to send portions to others that were not prepared. There were people that were not present in the congregation hearing the preaching, and he says, you need to go be a blessing to them. You need to take what you've been given, maybe some of that spiritual meat, and take it to somebody else that needs it and build them up and encourage them. I really believe that uh, we should share with others what we get from God. When we respond with repentance, then usually you know, there ought to be some fellowship and a restoration to God, getting closer to God. Uh, but look at the phrase at the end of verse 10. He says, For the joy of the Lord is your strength. He says you need to hear the reading, you need to hear the preaching, then do something about it and don't worry. You, the morning won't last for long because God wants to give you some spiritual strength and the joy of the Lord is your strength. You know when you get things right with God that He gives you joy that no one can take away from you? He gives you true joy that can last. I mean, hey, it can outlast a famine. You look at Joseph and you look at Daniel. We're reading with ne Nehemiah here who was kind of the same situation. He was taken away captive. He was a servant to a king that had a different God. I mean, he was like a wage slave in a sense. A lot of us are. Hey, even if you own your own business, I'm a slave to the customer, right? Uh, well, he's stuck in this situation. But God was able to use him to make a mighty change. If you would go to the next chapter. I, I, I want to go show chapter 9 real quick. I want to tell you that without preaching, without Bible preaching, a nation becomes wicked and ungodly. Wicked and ungodly. Look at verse 26. Nehemiah 9, verse 26. Nevertheless, they were disobedient and rebelled against thee and cast thy law behind their backs and slew thy prophets which testified against them to turn them to thee. And they wrought great provocations. I mean, they're making God angry. They, they don't even care what he says anymore. Verse 27, Therefore thou deliveredst them into the hand of their enemies who vexed them. What happens when you disobey God? He says, okay, I can't get your attention by being kind and sweet to you. You don't want to hear me? Then go under your enemies for a little while until your, your soul is vexed. Then I know you'll turn back to me and you'll cry unto me. Uh, go to verse 36. 
Nehemiah 10, look at verse, uh, I'm sorry, 9 rather. Nehemiah 9 still, verse 36. Behold, we are servants this day. He says, I'm a slave. I have no control. I have no power. He says, Behold, we are servants this day. And for the land that thou gavest unto our fathers to eat the fruit thereof and the good thereof, behold, we are servants in it. And it yieldeth much increase unto the kings whom thou hast set over us because of our sins. Also, they have dominion over our bodies and over our cattle and at their pleasure, and we are in great distress. What happens to a nation when they reject the Lord Jesus Christ as being their God? Guess what? Punishment's going to come. He's going to put some evil overlords, allow them to take everything. They control our body and our lands and our cattle and our children, and we're in great distress. This really hurts. This was the result of rejecting biblical preaching. Elsewhere in the book of Nehemiah, he even makes the, he shows that they were killing the prophets. Guys would come and preach to them and say, what are you doing? Thus saith the Lord. And they say, kill that guy. Shut him up. We don't want to hear what he has to say. Boy, isn't that the attitude in America today? If you would go to chapter 1. Nehemiah chapter 1. Without Bible preaching, a nation becomes wicked and ungodly. Listen to this. Proverbs 29, he says, where there is no vision, the people perish but he that keepeth the law, happy is he. Uh, Psalm 33, he says, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. If we want a blessing, we need to get back to obeying God and searching after God and seeking for His blessing. Uh, without Bible preaching, listen, a church, a congregation, an assembly, without Bible preaching, it becomes worldly and lazy. Those lazy Laodiceans, a church in the book of Genesis, in Revelation, it says, So then because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of thy mouth, of my mouth. God says, you make me sick. I just want to spit you out. Boy, I never want to be a church that makes God sick because we're not hold, caught, hold, hot or cold. We're lukewarm. We're just in the middle. We're neutral on everything. We're not going to take a stand on anything. We'll let everybody come in. That's not right. That's not how it ought to be. God wants us to take a stand. God wants a church to be close to Him. Listen, without Bible preaching, a family becomes broken and shattered. Bible preaching has the ability to restore families. This was the prophecy of John the Baptist to come. In fact, in Luke 1, he says, And he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. You know what he's saying? Bible preaching should help you get prepared to be used of God. Hey, I know there's things we need to do in this world and we all have a job or a skill set or a business and we have to figure out how to make the bills work so we can take care of those we're responsible for. But if you will spend more time giving accountability in your family to God, if you'll work more on your Bible study at home, then you will, the, the pay check, I promise you God will bless you, God will increase you, God will take care of you. Yeah. Without Bible preaching, an individual, a person, becomes sinful and deceived. They believe lies. In Proverbs 15 it says, He that refuseth instruction despiseth his own soul. But he that heareth reproof getteth understanding. It's a wise man that can be corrected and said, hey, what you're doing is wrong. You should change that. It's a wise man that goes to the book of the Lord and says, God, show me my errors and show me my faults and help me to become a sharper person for you. Help me to become a better Christian. Show me how to grow so you can use me in other ways. This is what a wise person would do. But boy, the person that wants to see their life destroyed... Just stop your ears and harden your neck and turn away from God and say, I don't want to hear that preaching. I'll tell you personally, there's been times when I've been the guy in the pew and the preacher gets on some topic and I'm thinking, boy, he's just after me and I know it. He's trying to get me. No, I, I see now that it's the Holy Spirit. I'll never forget it. Uh, uh, Brother Doug and uh, uh, Pell saying, he's, he's preaching to McClenny today, right? Uh, he came up and after he's like, him and his wife came up and they're like, it's like you were in our bedroom last night because what you're preaching on this morning is exactly what we were talking about. And you've got a whole sermon on it. 
It's like, did somebody call you and tell you? I'm like, did, did Doug like tell on us or something? Like, what? how did this work? And I'm like, hey, man, that's how the Holy Spirit works. Isn't it neat how sometimes you start drawing toward God or you draw toward someone and you say, Lord, how can I minister to someone? Or, Lord, there's this topic that needs to be dealt with. And the Holy Spirit uses the power to bring us to the Scriptures to find the answer. I believe God miraculously uses Bible preaching. And listen, if there's ever been a sermon that I've preached that's helped you, it's not me. It's not me. Just as Daniel said when he came and gave the interpretation to, to Nebuchadnezzar, he says, it's not in me, but there is a God. Boy, and He knows secrets, and He knows what's going on in the darkness, and He knows what's going on in your heart, and He knows what you need. And I do believe that God still works through Bible preaching. I really do. I submit myself to the power of God's Word and I ask Him to use me to be a conduit for His truth that His Word would go into your heart and change you and help you to become the kind of person that He, he wants to use. I really believe that. Why do we need Bible preaching is the question. Nehemiah 1, short chapter. I'm going to read it all and give the sense real quick. This will only take a moment. Look at verse number 1. It says, The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah, and it came to pass in the month Chislu, in the 20th year as I was in Shushan the palace, that Hananiah, one of my brethren, came and certain men of Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews that had escaped which were left of the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said unto me, The remnant that are left of the captivity there in the province, look at this, verse 3, are in great affliction and reproach, obviously the result of their sin. The wall of Jerusalem also is broken down, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. And it came to pass when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Now listen, he sees the problem. It's on his heart. His response, there's a pattern in this biblical response. He's crying. He's mourning. He's praying. He's fasting. This is such a serious issue before him and God. He says, God, I don't even want to eat because I want to hear from you. God, I'm going to withhold my time. I'm going to focus not on the things in this world, but I'm going to pray without ceasing and keep coming to you. And Lord, I don't know, but you do. And Lord, you have an answer and I need to hear from you. I mean, he was seriously pouring out his soul unto the Lord to the point he was afflicting his flesh with fasting. When's the last time, and don't answer, don't raise your hand, but do it in your heart before the Lord. When's the last time you withheld food? for the glory of God, so that you would get control over your spirit, so that you could get an answer in your life, so that you could begin to get power over sin. When was the last time that you afflicted your selfish, greedy flesh and said, no flesh, I'm not giving in to you, and I want to get closer to God, and I'm going to stop eating, not because I'm on a diet, but because I want to get close to God, and my flesh wants to eat, but I, I want to pray. When was the last time you actually made an effort and did that and said, I'm going to withhold my desire so God can give me an answer and get close to me? There's power in this pattern. Look at verse 5. And said, I beseech thee, O Lord God of heaven, the great and terrible God that keepeth covenant. For those that don't know, in the King James, this word is it's changed definition. If I say, oh, there was a spider, it was terrible, right? The word terrible means instills terror. Just as awesome, it's worthy of all and praise. Well, that's who God is. You understand, if you were to stand before Him today, you would get down on your face and humble yourself and say, oh God, you could destroy me and I'm humbled before you and you've been so kind and merciful to me. So He's, he's calling this out, these attributes of God. He's glorifying God and He says, you're the one that puts terror in their hearts and you're the one that has all the power. Right? So look at it. He says uh, in verse 5, and I beseech thee, O Lord God of heaven, the great and terrible God that keepeth covenant and mercy. Now, this is the characteristics of somebody that keeps their promise. Can God lie? In hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. God can't lie. He won't lie. He makes a covenant. He keeps his promise. He says that keepeth covenant and and mercy. That's what he's asking for. His prayer is, oh God, I need some mercy in this situation. Uh, uh, covenant and mercy for them that love him and observe his commandments. He continues his prayer. He says, let thine ear now be attentive 
and thine eyes open that thou mayest hear the prayer of thy servant, which I pray before thee now, day and night, for the children of Israel, thy servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against thee, both I and my father's house have sinned. This is a strong position to come from. You're showing how awesome and powerful God is and how perfect and He keeps His word. And then you humble yourself and you say, Hey God, we as a people have sinned. We've made some mistakes. And Lord, it's not just the people, it's me also. I have sinned, Lord. And, and you know what? It wasn't just me. My father, my daddy was a sinner. And Lord, would you please just be merciful and forgive us. And oh, you are great and powerful and loving and kind. And we're trusting in you for some of that mercy. We need to hear from you. This is being very serious about who you are. The proud Pharisee that comes and says, Oh God, give me what I need. How dare you? Come with a broken and a contrite heart. I need help. I need health. I need wisdom. I need humility. I need discernment. And it only comes from Him. Verse 7, He's confessing the sins. Verse 7, We have dealt very corruptly against Thee, and have not kept the commandments, nor the statutes, nor the judgments, which Thou commandest Thy servant Moses. Remember, I beseech thee, the word that thou commandest thy servant Moses, saying, If ye transgress, I will scatter you abroad the nations. Now, this, this remembrance. Can you imagine asking God to remember something? Uh, God doesn't have a memory problem like we do, but what's he saying? He's proclaiming the promise that he, know is, that he knows is in the word. God, you said if we disobey, you're going to punishment. And then he's going to say, and you also said, if we repent, you'll forgive us. Look at the next verse, verse 9. But if ye turn to me and keep my commandments and do them, though they were of you cast out into the uttermost part of heaven, yet will I gather them from thence and will bring them unto the place that I have chosen to set my name there. Now these are thy servants and thy people whom thou hast redeemed by thy great power. And thy strong hand. He's, he's saying, hey, you own us, Lord. We're the children. You've saved us. We're yours. Will you restore us? Can you help us out in this situation? Now, mind you, he's still in captivity. He hears the bad news about those that were there that were being attacked and scattered. There are a lot, there's 50,000 people living there at the time, and there was no wall. There was no gate. No temple. Things were messed up. They needed some help. Look at verse 11. This is so powerful. Oh, Lord, I beseech thee, let now thine ear be attentive to the prayer of thy servant and to the prayer of thy servants who desire to fear thy name and prosper. You know what our church ought to look like? People saying, I am a servant of God. I'm just a servant. I'm a nobody. I serve him. And you know what our desire ought to be? The ability to freely fear his name. They were living in oppression. They were under devastation. And he said, we desire to fear your name and prosper. Did you know God wants you to prosper? Look, this is not some Pentecostal prosperity gospel, name it and claim it. Uh, uh, I see a golden car in my future. It's nothing weird like that. But this is a solid truth from the book of the law of the Lord where he's telling you, if you want to fear God and prosper, God's going to bless you. I want you to learn this lesson. Nehemiah is coming to him in prayer saying, we just want to fear your name and we want to prosper while we're doing it. Aren't we kind of in that situation as a church? Like, Lord, we, we need a, a little bit more. But we don't just want more for our own glory. Lord, we're looking for a little more opportunity to go soul winning. We're looking for more families to reach and restore. We're looking for more chances to find the brokenhearted and restore them unto the teaching and preaching of the Word of God. When we come humbly with this spirit and this attitude, God will hear our prayer. And He will answer that prayer. Nehemiah, is quite, he says, uh, he, look, he says, who our servants, he says, who desire to fear thy name and prosper. I pray thee, thy servant this day, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man, for I was the king's cupbearer. What a statement. He says, now look, God, I really need something. Uh, there's a need 
for your people and I want to help. Uh, I'm stuck here serving a king and Lord, the heart of the king is in your hand. And Lord, if you see my heart that I want to uh, be remembered for doing something good for you, will you open this door of opportunity? Lord, I just want to fear you and prosper while I do it. And I know all I have to do is pray hard, believing that God hears and he will answer that prayer. And he did. He did. If we had time, we'd go through the whole chapter, but please just go back to Nehemiah 8. Go back to Nehemiah 8. God restored them. He gave them the opportunity to prosper and to thrive and to build and to grow and to bring these brokenhearted. And there were families scattered that were restored and there were people that were downtrodden that were brought back up. And boy, I mean, God's excited when He sees His people brought back together. I, I know He is. Yeah. Now look at verse 1 this time in Nehemiah 8. And all the people gathered. This is what we call church, gathering, assembly. We're all coming together. Uh, and all the people gathered themselves together as one man. This is what we call unity. We ought to speak the same things. We ought to be in godly unity in what we're doing and where we're going and how we're doing it, right? Uh, so they were together as one man into the street that was before the water gate. And they spake unto Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses which the Lord had commanded to Israel. That's the Bible. Only we have more now than they had. Boy, and we have it plentifully. I wish we'd just use it more, right? Verse 2, And Ezra the priest brought the law before the congregation, both of men and women, and all that could hear with the understanding upon the first day of the seventh month. This is what we call family integrated. That's just a tag we put on it. All that can understand. I know a couple babies went into the other room. They can still see it on the monitor and they can hear it. Mama can still see it. Praise the Lord for that technology, right? Uh, but meanwhile, we're all gathered together. Everyone that can understand needs to listen, pay attention, get the sense, get the understanding. And then you know what? You're going to be responsible to do something with what you hear today. Look what he says in verse 3. And he read therein before the street that was before the water gate, from the morning until midday. Now, we're going to be done in about five or seven minutes here. We're not going all day. But boy, they really were committed, weren't they? We're going all day. Whew. He says, from the morning until midday, before the men and the women and those that could understand. And the ears of the people were attentive unto the book of the law. Attentive. You know, uh, it talks about in the New Testament, it says to give attendance to reading. Back then, you had to show up in your person to be able to hear the book. You had to like show, I'm in attendance, good, now you can hear it. But here he's being attentive, not just saying, I'm sitting here, not just daydreaming, staring at a wall, thinking about what am I going to eat when I get out of here? Oh, what about this person or that person? Or what about these clothes or that video I saw? Being attentive means you're before God and the Holy Spirit coming down and convicting your conscience. You're going out of your way to pay attention to what you're learning here. That you want to know what's here. You're like a sponge soaking up the living water at the water gate here as the Word of God is being read. Verse 4. And Ezra the scribe stood upon the pulpit of wood, which they had made for the purpose. Now, we have a pulpit of wood. Now, I don't have to stand on it. Justice was going to read this morning, and he does. He, get, he gets up like this when he reads, right? But he's, he's growing fast. It won't be long. He won't have to do that, right? But why are they standing up? Because it's the Word of God that should be magnified. That's what we're here to see in here, right? In fact, look at verse... Five. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people. Again, here's the authority. This is the source. It's not some funny story or a cartoon. This is the holy words of God, of the living God. He opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people. Again, that's how the word of God should be. And when he opened it, all the people stood up, and Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God. You know what it means when they bless the Lord? He's talking about praying. How can you bless God? I mean, we're asking him, God, can you bless me? You've got it all. Yeah, and he says, will you bless me a little bit by asking me, glorifying me, praising me, praying to me, believing that you can receive? This is what he expects from us. Prayer. 
Prayer is part of church. Listen, if you have some major need in your life, I would encourage you to come back Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. We're going to have an old-fashioned prayer meeting, and we're going to pour out our heart to God. And we've got a list of the things that really matter to us. And we're going to ask you if you have something else that matters to you. And us men, we're going to get together, and we're going to humbly ask God to answer these prayers. And we have friends in other cities that need major health miracles. And I'm not scratching them off the list because I know God can do it. And I know he can help with your job too. And I know he can help with the little things in the direction that you need in life. I know he can. We need prayer. Look, so they're praying. He blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, amen, amen. You know what you need to do sometimes when you hear something you agree with? You need to just say, amen. oh, come on. I want all the people to glorify God and say, amen. Amen means I agree. And sometimes in our family, we need to see dad say, Amen, that's right, preacher. <laughs> or justice, you hear something you like, and you're like, man, that makes sense, that's good. You can say, that's true. I'll take that. That's the same as saying amen, wouldn't you agree? Or I know brother Jake's from Georgia. He can say, that dog will hunt, right? Or something like that. I mean, we'll take whatever you got. Just say, that's good. I like that. Woo! That's right. Look, we can get excited and encourage people through the preaching. Like, amen, that's right, that's good, that's true. We need to say these things and confirm it. Yeah. And we're giving God the glory. Look, he continues in this verse, verse 6, he says, With lifting up their hands, they bowed their heads and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. This is talking about musical worship. We sing God through psalms and hymns and spiritual songs uh, and, uh, and choruses and fill in the blank, right? Now, we uh, hold a hymnal and we put our face to the ground, right? But anyway, uh, obviously it's a little bit different, but they were pouring out their heart, praising the Lord. You watch any major performer and they're going to stick their chin up and they'll put their nose in the air and show you how good they are. This isn't about our glory. It's about God's glory. We should sing unto the Lord. Thank you, Brother Chad, for telling us what some of these words mean and reminding us of the person that wrote it and what it meant to them and what it ought to mean to us and where we're going to go one day. These words in our hymns and psalms and spiritual songs, they have good doctrine. The music we sing ought to have good doctrine. They worship through prayer and singing. Look at verse 8. So they read in the book of the law of God distinctly. They made it very clear what was being said. They help you understand. And they gave the sense, it says next, and caused them to understand the reading. This is the goal of church. And listen, I've said it a lot. Man, fellowship is super important. And singing is right up there. And I, I, I thought about making a little chart and showing the order of importance, but I'm afraid of getting it out of order because I'm just going on my opinion. But he's trying to show us here the culmination of their service of worshiping God and gathering together was preaching the Bible. Amen. We need Bible preaching to get us closer to God, to understand Him more. I don't have a stranglehold on the truth. It's not, this is not the Adam Fannin show. I thank God we live in a, in a church where we're in a church here where some of the other men can get up and preach. Now, I sent this to Brother Doug earlier. Where was that? Numbers... Was that Numbers 11? He says, uh, Brother Doug's preaching at another church this morning. And I sent this. It says, Would God that all the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put His Spirit upon them. Would God that some men would stand up and say, I want to be a preacher. And listen to me, you young men. They're, they're, we're having men's preaching night tonight. You come back and listen to these guys. They have the Holy Spirit inside of them. And they want to open the Scriptures and tell you what it means and show you what God's will is out of His Word. We need Bible preaching. And you know what? I thank God that He works through greater men than me. And you know what? Lesser men than me also. It's the next generation coming up that need to see this vision and say, well, one day I want to be a preacher. I don't know if I can be a pastor, but surely I ought to at least be able to open it up and give somebody an answer and tell them what it means. Hey, you can, young man. Make that goal. Take that goal. Let it happen in your life. He continues, verse 10, he says, Then said he unto them, Go your way, eat the fat and drink the sweet. 
course, in verse 9, I skipped it where he says, all the people wept when they heard. There's a response. Sometimes it breaks your heart. Let God do what He wants to do in your heart. Be tender to the preaching of the Word of God. Let Him change you and convict you and just make you who you ought to be. Bible preaching saves lives. In verse 10, he says, uh, Go and eat the fat and drink the sweet and send portions unto them for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy unto our Lord. Neither be ye sorry, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Sometimes after hearing the preaching and changing your mind, God's going to give you true joy. And that joy will strengthen you to get through the hard times. That joy will strengthen you to send provisions to others. There's more we can look at in this chapter where they do go in fellowship and they continue to eat and they come back for more preaching and the whole nine yards and they change what they're doing and God begins to pour out a huge blessing on all of these people. I'd like to close with an analogy, if you'd let me. A bicyclist, an athlete, a guy, I met a guy years ago. Boy, you could tell he was a bicyclist. Let's, let's call him Bill. Bill was a fanatic. How do you know that Bill liked bicycles so much? He loved riding bikes more than anything else. That's where he got his true joy. Even when he wasn't riding a bike, you could tell. He's like, those are some funny looking sneakers. Oh, those are, those are bike riding you know, sneakers or whatever. Right? Oh, okay. So listen, he loved riding bikes so much that you could see it in his life because you could see it in how he dressed. He wore the funny little outfits and had the funny little hat and he'd have a number on his back and it's like, well, Bill's going riding a bike. He's a bike guy. That's just what he does. He's known for riding bikes. He loves riding bikes. And well, he's always out there talking about bikes and the next big thing. And he's inviting others to come and try riding bikes. And hey, I got an extra bike. Come with me and I'll take you there and I'll get you there and I'll show you what you got to do. And well, you're going to love it. Bill was such a fanatic for riding bikes that he was inviting other people. He would only hang out with other guys that were just sold out to the uh, athletes of, of bicycling. I mean, he wanted to be a professional. He was so determined. He, he had the best bike. It was tried and true. He trusted his life with that bike. He knew that it was dependable. He persuaded others that his was the best. He spent his time with other enthusiasts just talking about the sport. When his bike was down and he was separated from riding, he was depressed and kind of like a fish out of water. Bill loved bikes so much, everyone knew it. And you know, he said, Bill, how'd you get into bikes? Well, somebody invited me to come and go for a ride. They just invited me one day and I went for a test ride and boy, that was it. I just fell in love. How's your Christianity? I'm not asking you to be an out-of-balance fanatic, but I'm just asking you to kind of be a fan of the sport of Bible preaching. <laughs> can you take that application and put it on your life and say, how, how can somebody know? My wife was getting chicks uh, <laughs> yesterday. What did what, what that guy's shirt say? I forget. Some verse on the back of his shirt. It was really kind of cool. And I saw somebody yesterday, same thing. Now, I saw a guy yesterday at work, and this guy had a Star Wars shirt, and he had Star Wars on his phone, and Star Wars on his watch, and all this like, uh, do you like Star Wars? How do I know? Well, that's your idol in life. You just love it. That's all you talk about. As Christians, we ought to love Bible preaching so much that we're willing to tell somebody, somebody that even claims the name of Christ, but you're like, well, they go to a weak church and they got the wrong Bible and I'm not even sure if they have the right gospel, but man, I heard a sermon that's so good. You got to get a hold of this. You got to take this thing for a test drive and I hope you fall in love with Bible preaching like I have because it can change your life. If you believe that, then you ought to be sold out for it. You ought to fill the gaps of your free time in your life with hearing the reading of the Word of God and with searching after Bible preaching. I promise you God will bless you. Amen. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank You so much for Your Word and this congregation. Lord, thank You that we can worship You together. Lord, I pray that You would allow Your Spirit to descend upon this place at this point that you would convict our hearts and change our lives. Lord, I pray that you would help us to be full of the Holy Spirit as we worship you through song. Lord, I ask you that you would help us to just shine this light into a dark world and give us the confidence to share you